alkene addition reactions. In this lesson, I'm going to provide an introduction to this topic. We've got a whole chapter on these reactions, and we're going to talk about things like Markovnikov's rule, which governs the uh, regioselectivity of these reactions. We'll talk about the stereoselectivity as well, that's syn versus anti-addition. We'll talk about how you predict how many products uh, might be formed in an alkene addition reaction based on how many chiral centers result from the reaction. Now this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so to start this off, we've just got to take a look at the anatomy of an alkene addition reaction. So in an alkene, we're going to be trading a pi bond for two new sigma bonds. So in this case, I've just got them labeled A and B. So, and as long as you're adding two different things, though, we might have to consider them adding in two different ways. And so I've got it written one way here, but maybe B here adds on the other side. And then A ends up where B used to be. And so we've got to at least consider the possibility of these two ways, and we'll find out that for you know most of these reactions, they end up with two different groups, and they prefer one of these over the other. So it turns out, in the first step of the mechanism of all our alkene reactions, the alkene is the nucleophile. And it's going to be a coming and attacking either an H plus ion or an electrophile. And when it does, so it turns out majority of the time, that's going to end up on the less substituted side of the alkene. So notice this is a primary carbon, this is a secondary carbon, and the less substituted primary carbon is typically where the H plus or electrophile that gets attacked in the first step of the mechanism is going to end up. Now it turns out, we can kind of see why this happens here, so it turns out the intermediate in a few of these reactions is a carbocation. And let's say we attached a hydrogen on that less substitute side, it leaves you with a carbocation intermediate on the more substitute side. And so had we done this the other way around, put the H on the secondary carbon, we would have ended up with a primary carbocation, but doing it the way we did, we ended up with a more stable secondary carbocation, and that's going to explain why we prefer preferentially get one over the other of these two different regioisomers. Cool, it turns out in the next step, a nucleophile is now going to come attack the carbocation and attach there. And so B here, it turns out, is going to be some variety of nucleophiles. And we'll leave that generic here for a little bit. So, and it turns out as long as you add the hydrogen or electrophile on the less substitute side and the nucleophile on the more substitute side, you'll have accomplished what we call Markovnikov addition. So Markovnikov studied these reactions, and this was the most common result, and we call it Markovnikov addition. Now, you'll have to memorize who the either H plus or electrophile is for every single one of our sets of reagents, and therefore who the nucleophile is. And then you'll also have to recall if it goes Markovnikov, or if it ends up doing the opposite. So in this case, A here again is H plus, or the electrophile, and B over here. The nucleophile, and this is way less common. In fact, we're only going to cover two out of our like 15 reactions that will end up going opposite of Mr. Markovnikov's rule here. So, and when it goes opposite Markovnikov's rule, we just call it anti Markovnikov. We don't get too creative on the name. Cool. And so, when a reaction goes either Markovnikov or anti Markovnikov, we refer to that as the regio selectivity because it's going to tell you preferentially which regio isomer is your major product. And the vast majority of the reactions, again, are going to go Markovnikov, but two of them we'll study will go anti Markovnikov. Now, we got one more thing to talk about in this regard, and that's stereo selectivity. And that is there any relationship in the stereochemistry of the two groups that add? So, and before we get there, though, we actually got to take this one other place to see why that's even important. So, if we look at a reactant in an alkene, we've got two sp2 hybridized carbons that are about to turn into sp3 hybridized carbons. And that's important because as sp2 carbons, they're never going to be chiral centers. But in turning into sp3 hybridized carbons, they might turn into chiral centers. As a chance, as being sp3 and tetrahedral, as long as they got four different groups, they're going to be chiral centers. And so in a typical alkene reaction, so you have a chance of forming up to two new chiral centers is typically the way it works. Now, if neither one of these turns into a chiral center, we can kind of classify this here. So let's say number of chiral centers 
If you don't form any, if those out of the two options you had, neither one turns into a chiral center, then you're just gonna form a single achiral product. And so I'll label this as the number of products. And you just get the one achiral product and life is good, life is easy. Now, on the other hand, let's say one of these two becomes a chiral center, so one out of two. Well, again, if you have one chiral center, it can exist as R or S. And for every single alkene reaction, doesn't matter any of the 15 we'll, that we study here, if you get one chiral center, you're gonna get two products, R and S. And if that's the only chiral center, well, then that, those would be enantiomers. But if there are other chiral centers, then these might be diastereomers instead. But the key is you still get two products, two different stereoisomers. What it gets tricky though, is if you form two new chiral centers. If where you add the electrophile and the nucleophile, if both of those turn into chiral centers, we have a problem. So, and the problem is that now you have a chance of getting up to as many as four stereoisomers. So with two chiral centers, two to the N, where two to the two power is four different stereoisomers. It could be RR, SS, RS, or SR. So with four possibilities, it really depends on the reaction now. And so it turns out, when we talk about stereoselectivity, so there is in some reactions a relationship between the nucleophile and the electrophile where they have to add to the same side both from the back or both from the front. In which case, then you get two options, both from the back or both from the front. And out of the four possible stereoisomers that could exist when you have two chiral centers, you only get two of them. There are other reactions, though, that actually involve backside attack and end up with the nucleophile electrophile adding from opposite sides, one from the front, one from the back, in one of two possibilities. And in that case, we call that anti-addition. You only get two possible products. So if they added the same face, front, both front or both back, we call that syn addition, and you get two possible products. And if they add the opposite faces, you get two possible products, we call that anti-addition. And then you have the option where there's just no stereoselectivity whatsoever, and you get both the two syn and the two anti-addition products. You get all four possible stereoisomers. Now, if you look at the little table on your handout that's like this on your handout, it doesn't actually say number of chiral centers. It says number of chiral centers formed. So I don't, it's not the number of chiral centers in the whole molecule, just how many you formed when your sp2 carbons became sp3. So, and then it also, instead of saying the number of products, it says the usual number of products. So, and the reason we gotta be careful here is that sometimes you form meso compounds. And so a meso compound and its mirror image are exactly the same. And so you might actually get fewer products than what we would normally predict here. But with two chiral centers, that is the only time the stereoselectivity matters. So if there's no stereoselectivity and you form two chiral centers, you're generally gonna get all four products. So if you have syn or anti-stereoselectivity and you form two chiral centers, you're generally just gonna get two out of the four possibilities forming as a result of your reaction. All right, so now we've covered the regioselectivity, which the options are Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov, and we've covered the stereoselectivity, which is syn versus anti, or just none. And so one thing to note, be very careful that you don't shorten anti-Markovnikov just saying anti. Is it Markovnikov or anti? Because anti is something else. That's stereoselectivity in this context. And so just be very careful. Anti-Markovnikov is regioselectivity. Just saying plain old anti refers to stereoselectivity. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share, a couple of the best things you can do to promote the channel. And if you're looking for the study guides that go with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice problems, my premium course on chadsprep.com not only includes the study guides, but also comes with quizzes, chapter tests, and practice final exams.